Welcome back to the Football Fitness Federation podcast. This is episode 180 and I'm delighted to be joined on the podcast today by Damien Harper and Gareth Sanford. How are we doing? Very well. Thanks for having us. Yes, great. Thanks, Ben. Thank you for coming on, lads. I really appreciate it. We were just saying before we started recording that this one's been in the pipeline a little while, but I've been looking forward to getting in some of the into the topics that we've got coming up. Um, but in true podcast style, let's go into a little bit of background to start with. So, Damon, do you just want to kick us off? Your background, your career that sort of led you up to doing what you're doing at the moment? Yeah, no problems, Ben. Um, so, yeah, thanks again for having us on. Um, I'm sure this is going to be a really interesting discussion that we have. Uh, so, I'm currently a lecturer in coaching and performance at the University of Central Lancashire in, in the UK. Uh, and I work in the Institute of Coaching and Performance. Uh, where I supervise students on the professional master's and professional doctorate in elite performance. Uh, so those qualifications are, are geared towards students who are out there in the professional field, working in full-time jobs, a lot of them, uh, looking to solve uh, performance problems within their organisations. So, uh, yeah, quite fortunate at the minute to be working with a number of, of, of practitioners out there in elite football, uh, trying, to, trying, to, trying to answer their own you know, problem, problems in, in their own applied fields, which is, which is superb. Uh, so yeah, pr prior to, um, uh, to joining uh, at UCLan, um, yeah, I've, I've been heavily involved in academic uh, roles and also as a practitioner as well. Uh, I've just recently finished my PhD actually uh, last year. Um, so that was a big, big part of my time over the last six years where I've started to really look into uh, examining deceleration in team sport athletes. And, and that's linked me into, you know, some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today, obviously in the podcast around decelerations in uh, modern football and, and breaking, if we want to call it that as well. Um, so yeah, I, I've developed a, a breaking performance research group on the back of my PhD, uh, which aims to try and enhance understanding of deceleration and breaking in team sports and, and, and modern, modern uh, football performance. Uh, and that sits within the new, newly developed football performance hub at UCLan, uh, which I'm a member of as well. Uh, consulted with a number of organisations um, over the last six years, looking at deceleration and breaking and speeding team, team sport athletes. Uh, one of them actually with Gareth, which we, we, we worked, did a bit of work with the English Football Association, looking at training solutions to uh, prepare international footballers to meet the demands of international uh, competition uh, and and I was uh, tasked with looking at the the breaking strength framework obviously so that was that was an interesting project where I got to work with Gareth and uh, a few other people on that um, so yeah um, that that's really where I'm at the minute over the last six years as a practitioner I've been working on the England girls talent pathway uh, as a physical performance coach and consultant um, so yeah that that's 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 myself Brilliant. That's awesome, mate. And Gareth, what about yourself? Yeah, so thanks for having us again, uh, Ben. I'm originally from the UK, but haven't lived there for a little while. Um, studied at Loughborough in um, undergrad and master's with a year working at Chelsea. In between, so that was my first kind of exposure to professional football and working in that environment. Um, did my PhD in New Zealand um, on the topic of the anaerobic speed reserve. And then that was with primarily middle distance running, which maybe at first saying it sounds a million miles away from what we're going to be talking about today. But actually, the physiology that you get in middle distance athletes is very similar to the spread of the types of physiology you get in football squads. Um, so since working with middle distance, I've then been consulting with a lot of team sports around this topic of how do we manage such a range of different profiles in our squad, which we can jump into today. Currently, I'm on Vancouver Island, working with Triathlon Canada and Athletics Canada, uh, leading their physiology support. And um, yeah, still working with professional teams and fitness coaches, trying to figure out the, uh, the puzzle of getting fit. And uh, yeah, pleased to be here. Brilliant. Well, there's loads to cover, so I'm keen to get straight into it because I think we can get some good discussions going on this today. But 
I was going to start quite broad and just talking. I saw Gareth obviously posting about some great stuff over on Twitter and it sort of sparked the idea for the podcast. And then also after putting out a few times recommended guests and things like that, it, your names actually came up. So um, that was always good. And then a few topics in um, to consider with that as well, which we'll go into in a little bit. But just to start with, we've spoke about this a little bit before on the podcast, the demands of the modern game. Can you give your perspectives on where we sit in terms of the, the key demands of the modern game and maybe how it's differed from previously? Um, Gareth, do you want to, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can do. I think uh, the, the conversation Damien and I started having around this was from some work from George Nassis, who I believe back in the day worked for Panathinaikos. Um, <laughs> if people remember, remember those guys. Um, and one of the things that he was observing is that, you know, we, we're certainly seeing more and more fixtures come to the table, more and more demands on players where maybe, um, you know, in the early 2010s, we were maybe in the 50, 60 games a season mark, and that's now trending further and further upwards. We think about the increased allocation of teams on the international stage for World Cups. We think of the, the National League series. We think of all these extra commitments, and it really raises the question, how are we going to prepare players for this increased density of games that are required of them? over longer periods in the season. And maybe I'll hand over to Damien to dive into some of the specifics on what that means from a physical performance perspective, because a lot of the um, initial discussion from George was around these yeah, broad characteristics, seeing increases in game speed and estimating things like that. But we looked at it and said, well, hey, there's a big physical cost of being able to do that or having to do that. So how can we best prepare, prepare players for that? So maybe pass on to Damien to take a deeper dive on that. Yeah, I mean, I'm just just echoing what what Gareth just said there. It was you know a fascinating article what George Narcis wrote with uh, Peter Crustrup actually looking at some of these demands and what what they're forecasting in terms of future future demands leading up to 2030. And you know I, I reached out to Gareth and a few other people actually who've been involved in elite football at the time and and really just wanted to continue some of those discussions what George had raised. And we actually got together and wrote a letter in response to George um, about some of perhaps some of the additional things that we need to consider with with the developments in the modern game. Um, as Gareth said, we've, we've seen we're going to see more matches. We're going to see a substantial increase in games. You know, uh, Gareth mentioned possibly seventy to eighty games per season. Uh, and with that, you know, one of the things which I think's been quite a hot topic recently, particularly over the Christmas period, is the fixture congestion and the amount of fixtures that players are having to play in short periods of time. Um, you know, there's some really good examples over that Christmas period that we can perhaps get into um, later in the podcast, which, you know, was raised by a number of the top managers in, in the Premier League about concerns of player welfare, player health, uh, and, and being able to uh, meet the demands of, of repeated games and just short schedules. Um, but coming back to the, you know, the, the letter that we wrote, one of the things that we highlighted was that George Nassis and their colleagues were identifying that the game is going to be played at higher speeds. Um, it's going to be played at higher speeds um, and that could result in, in, in greater fatigue and, and risk to injuries of players. Um, but those, those forecasts were based on high speed running and, and sprinting distances. Um, so what, one thing we wanted to highlight, and you know, this is certainly something which I'm really keen to explore more, more depth um, into is that these high speed running and sprinting distances don't necessarily consider short accelerations and decelerations. And I think what we're seeing with the modern game is certainly uh, a much greater demand on short accelerations and, and, you know, rapid deceleration movements with some of the new kind of like tactic tactics we see with, with high pressing, for example, as, 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 as one of the, the tactical um, methods that's used by a lot of, lot of teams that today to get, you know, to get success and, and, and scoring opportunities. So I think that was what we wanted to add, that there's certainly going to be need to, to, to look at more accelerations and decelerations, more, more in-depth. And the other thing we raised was that the 
predictions were based on um, absolute arbitrary thresholds. So uh, all players basically put into the same category. And there was no, there's not been really any individualization of, 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 of the demands that are experienced by players in the game. And that was something that we felt, particularly moving into these higher demands, it's really important that we get these accurate in terms of these forecasts. And um, we felt that, well, we recommended the development of a high speed or high intensity locomotor profile, um, which we can probably dig into a little bit more deeper as we go into the podcast, which would, would cater for a player's maximal acceleration, maximal deceleration, maximal sprinting speed, and uh, anaerobic speed reserve, uh, which is Gareth's forte in terms of anaerobic speed reserve, looking at the you know, the, the, the maximal sprinting speed and maximal aerobic speed capabilities of the player um, to be able to get a good insight of, of, of individual player demands and training needs moving forward. Yeah, so maybe just before we go, go on to that, to put some hard numbers on this for people, you, the, the original NACIS article was estimating an anticipated 40% increase in high-intensity running distance now. Of course, there's how do you quantify high intensity running distance, all this kind of thing. But even if let's say it's 20%, that is still a non-trivial increase from where we are now. Um, and so are we preparing people for the demands today or the demands tomorrow? And that's the real catch 22 I see for practitioners in the environment is that, you know, the next game's coming on Wednesday. Uh, so how can we be thinking about what's coming in the next five, six years? Um, on the game speed front, George was suggesting from ball player tracking that would jump from around eight meters a second to nine meters a second. And from testing a lot of maximal sprinting speed over the last seven years, um, that's going to be up and around some people's max velocity. Now, obviously, ball speed movement is different to that, but I think we want to be looking at the demands in conjunction to what are our capacities to handle things speeding up. Brilliant. I mean, a little example I give of, of that, Gareth, is, you know, it's like comparing Mbappe uh, mm. versus Benzema. Or, yeah. you know, a worst case scenario, looking at Mbappe versus somebody like Andy Carroll, you know, <laughs> in, terms, in terms of their top speed capabilities and how they accumulate that top speed distance is going to be very different. Uh, if we look at an absolute threshold compared to their individual yeah. relative maximum. Yeah, great example. There's a couple of ways we can go with this, and I want to try and touch on as much of it as I can, but just pulling up on one thing that we just mentioned just previously in terms of the fixtures and congestion, it actually ties really nicely into the last episode that I did where we spoke about freshness v fitness, and basically with the congestion of games, you get periods, don't you, where teams will have it off and it can be beneficial. But then there's also that period of sort of absence without game for whatever reason, where it gets to the point where players are losing that sharpness and then they come back to the game and it, and it, and it looks like a different team. And that's a, I suppose that's a debate in itself, isn't it? In terms of this congestion of fixtures or even the increase in fixtures, how we prepare for that, because we're going to have intense parts of the season where there's going to be a lot of games and it's great when you're winning because um, you're in, in momentum, but when we're not, obviously there's a pile up of, of fixtures, isn't there? And it becomes a bit more of a challenge. Um, is there anything you've got on, on that, Damien? Um, I, I, I'm just going back to that example over Christmas in terms of that congested fixture. Uh, I think it was Liverpool who, and Klopp was, was you know, highlighting that they played, I think, three games in six days. And then they had a four-day recovery period. And then they had to play Chelsea, you know. So, um, you, you know, if we're looking at congested fixtures, you know, typically that's that's defined as like two matches with recovery um, between matches of less than nine six hours, you know. So that that's that's really high demands on on players to be able to to, to meet and cope with and perform to some of the demands that the modern day's got to modern day players got to got to be able to. Um, to, to achieve, uh, to, to get to get the success that they want, um, you know. So I think, uh, without doubt, it's 
it's being able to understand what are the training methods that we're going to be able to, to use. But at the same time, I think that's where, what are the recovery methods and, you know, you know, it, the advantages with bigger squads and better quality players, how they can manage that rotation to be able to ensure that, that players are, are performing at their optima um, or, or the, the team is performing at the optima, you know, in terms of a, uh, for, for each game. And, 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 and that's, I suppose, ranking those games as well in terms of importance and, and, and which squad players are going to be best suited to the, the tactics that they're going to employ for each game. So I think it's, um, it's certainly when we look at the demands, I think that's where, you know, it, it, it is really, really high, high demanding, you know, in terms of, you know, performing in, in a game. You know, in terms of numbers, we're looking at, you know, 10 to 12 kilometres per match. Um, in total distance, you know, around about 1,000 metres of high-speed running. We could be looking at, you know, with quite a bit of variability, depending on what positions, you know, around about 200 to 400 metres sprinting distance. And then, you know, certainly the accelerations and decelerations is something which I'm really interested in. You know, players possibly performing 50 accelerations per game. This is high-intensity accelerations and, and potentially up to 90 high intensity decelerations per match, mm. you know, so it's, you know, with, with less than 48 hours recovery between games, you know, we really are talking about players who are not going to be able to compete at the top level, but also players who are going to be at high risk of injury. I think another piece to another way to tilt this is, you know, you touch there on sharpness and my question would be is like, how do you define that? Of course, there's a technical, tactical piece to that, but there is a fitness piece to that. And sometimes to me, not being sharp could be, I can't keep up with the pace of what's going on physically, hmm. right? And so how much of this is how we're conditioning players versus technical, tactical, you know, full speed type awareness, I think that's an interesting discussion for us because, you know, time is limited for coaches and it is a challenge. There's no doubt about that. Um, but how across the season can we build a player's fitness beyond pre-season um, rather than maybe the scenario where we, we finish pre-season and that's as good as it gets and it's like holding on. And then, like, by game 12 of an EPL season, you're looking around going, well, the boys don't look that sharp. And it's like, well, is that a technical, tactical thing? Maybe, maybe not. I think, but I think that's a, it, it's an important thing for us to reflect on because um, something I'll just share that, that I see a lot is that there's a, a big emphasis on the high-intensity side and a big tension between what should be sport specific and what should be building physical capacities to support performance. And, you know, there are two pathways to develop that aerobic system from a more continuous low intensity side and the high intensity side. And so we really want to make sure, in my opinion, that we're building both of those throughout the season and the high intensity pathway when you're in deep fixture congestion you can't just pile on more intensity, you know? So there needs to be some kind of strategy in my view around this low intensity and critical speed uh, type aerobic conditioning to enable you to continue to build fitness over time. I think of it like a bank mm -hmm. where low intensity work on the aerobic side is like making deposits into a bank. And every time we do a big mass session or we do, lots of speed endurance work, we're, we're cashing out, we're taking money out the bank. When we play a game, we're taking money out the bank. So if we get into these dense fixture periods and our bank account's running low, we're going to get to a point where there's nothing left in there. And we're going, hey, the boys don't look sharp. It's like, well, there's nothing in the bank. And so realizing that you know there's variability between different squads as to how much control a conditioning coach might have over what training looks like from a 
technical tactical side, but I think the point Damien and I are really making here today is on the physical side, this locomotive profile and the qualities that underpin it are things that coaches can be looking at year round to make sure we're continually moving the needle that is going to enable players to repeat and recover more consistently. And not just that, build over time across a season and not get to the next season and go, hey, have we actually moved anyone on here? And because the game is so day-to-day -day for practitioners, that's a real big challenge. Like I speak to a lot of people and, you know, I've had some coaches say, hey, like I've been at a club, you know, five plus seasons. And I'm not sure how much we've moved people on in certain areas. And, you know, I think when you hear stuff like that, we've got to look at that and go like, how, how are we delivering this? And what are the ways we can add on? And I'm not saying that, Footballers need to train like endurance athletes, but there are principles of aerobic training, of you know middle distance running and other team sports that can really apply here to to give players the edge in building those capacities over time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think it, in terms of the sort of fixtures, congestion, all that, we we can't battle it too much because it, essentially it's gonna. It's going to happen, isn't it? But what we can do is what we're talking about now and come up with strategies where we can prepare players in the best possible way. Um, in terms of what that would look like then throughout a, throughout a season, starting on the, the, the aerobic side a little bit more, and then I want to touch on the XLD cell um, component as well, Damien, in a second. But Gareth, to start with, in terms of like week to week, day to day, in terms of practically how that informs our practice throughout a season, what, what would you say that looks like? Yeah, I guess if we zoom out a uh, bigger picture, we mentioned at the beginning the anaerobic speed reserve, and I would start here because the first thing you want to do is understand the distribution of the types of athlete profiles you have in your squad, meaning that some players are going to come to the game more speed-based, someone like, a, you know, Bakai Osaka, hudson Adoy, these kind of players, right? They're going to come at the game for a more speed-based end. Then you're going to have players at the other end of that, right? Like your Jordan Henderson's and James Milner's of this world, right? Which are maybe Bernardo Silva's that are going to run your 12, 13 Ks in a game, right? And then you've got everything in between. So what the anaerobic speed reserve, which is, is the speed range from the max aerobic speed to the maximal sprinting speed, what those two values allow you to do is essentially understand the relative balance of those two measures across your squad. And that can really highlight, well, who's more speed oriented, who's more endurance oriented. Then from there, we can have better discussions about what might be appropriate methods to really maximize conditioning in those individuals. That's on the individual side. I also think on the sort of tactical, technical training side, you want to understand the distribution of what your coach's method is giving you in terms of stimulus. So if we took... Jurgen Klopp and we took Jose Mourinho and we took Pep Guardiola and we took Mikel Arteta, we would get four different training models that have slightly different emphasis in terms of what they're conditioning, right? Whether it's small-sided games, whether or, or a Thomas Tuchel that may be a bit more low intensity German type model, right? We want to understand that because then from there, we can map on top of that our player profiles and go, okay, this model is probably going to suit either you know, people in the middle or endurance types a bit more, that means when the players aren't doing that stuff, we need to really focus on these areas. So by setting things up right with profiling, you can really make one decision that, you know, gives you several individual actions afterwards that you just don't have if you're not making those, those upfront calls. So... From my side, I think I talked about a bit earlier, there's two strands of developing aerobically, right? There's your low intensity continuous work and there's your, your high intensity work. So generally speaking, like I said, with the bank analogy, the low intensity and critical speed work, critical speed is approximately in football players, typically around 80% of their max aerobic speed. In elite endurance athletes, that can be as high as 95%. So that suggests that there's probably a big 
headroom of aerobic training conditioning there for, for football players if we can look at maybe microdosing that kind of stimulus you know we see a lot of that in like the strength training literature applications of football you know some of Mathieu Lacombe's work on like eccentric training you know one one block of uh, four reps a week can see increases in, in eccentric strength and so we want to look at that same kind of principle and take that to the aerobic conditioning side and when I talk to coaches and you say okay how many times a week do you have players in the gym it's maybe once or twice a week what do you do the day after the game sometimes not that much if you took even just those three scenarios there's probably room there to accumulate five minutes on the bike either side of uh, the gym session so there's, there's 20 minutes you look at the day after a game actually doing something and just moving like 20 minutes is going to help you feel better and recover quicker um, and then you've got 40 minutes already of aerobic work without really having to stress uh, and find somewhere to, to fit this in you know then you've got the pitch work of course which so so very quickly you can build a picture of is aerobic work in the program week in, week out? So step one is like, are we looking for that? Are we making sure that is there? And then step two, I think a hard thing with the low intensity stuff is it, it can feel redundant. I understand why some people might feel like that about the low intensity stuff, but the aerobic system isn't a light switch, right? You can't just decide like we, we're going to do a few sessions and then it's it's up. What we get if we just fall on high intensity stuff is like we get a boost and then it kind of plateaus and you can't just keep adding more intensity. You kind of stagnate. So if you want to build, like imagine a crescendo in music, right, that, that grows over time, the low intensity stuff has to layer like the bank and that's going to enable us to do a greater capacity of high intensity work. And so I know one of the things we talked about before Ben was like high intensity pressing game and this this kind of thing and it's like my my thing with all of this I get asked a lot like what do you think of this high speed running distance or or, or the other and the question is what is the cost of the athletes to do that because number one it's not the same for everybody it's all relative to their individual physiology so what proportion of mass what proportion of critical speed if it's above mass, what proportion of their anaerobic speed reserve are they having to work at to do that? Because we know that working at higher percentages of those markers represent or, or associate with greater fatigue. And so if we're not looking at it against those things, then we don't really know the answer to that. And, and Damien talks about getting individual. You know, this is a real key piece for, for me. If you know, if we're trying to do this three times a week, then we might be able to do it once, but come back again and do it on Wednesday. You know, and so really understanding that cost both of the work and then how you fall out of that in terms of recovery is kind of everything. Brilliant, Damien. Have you got anything to add on that? Um, you know, John, just really interesting on, you know, what Gary's been saying there about the, the lower, the, the importance of low intensity work, you know, in terms of generating those aerobic capacities. And I think they're really important, you know, in terms of just, you know, the recovery, enhancing the recovery of the players. Um, if we're getting onto the, if I move a little bit onto the X cells and D cell side of things. Just you before know, you do, Damien, can I just yeah. double click on that point? Because there is an argument that, you know, in training every day, you'll get 60 to 90 minutes worth of session. And I would say for speed profiles, they're probably getting a fair amount of the low intensity sort of easy stuff they need from that, that time on feet. They're probably not getting critical speed from that, which is really key. So critical speed is the last speed that is almost exclusively supported by the aerobic system. So if we're wanting to know how fit someone is, critical speed is your marker. We do want to know mass because it's an important training pace for raising the VO2 max, but mass is, is an aerobic and anaerobic measure. 
So if we're trying to make a decision aerobically how fit someone is just off mass, you can see how that's a problem, right? It's not a clean representation of, of the aerobic speed. So I wanna know both those two. But if we take the endurance athlete or the endurance profiles who are in that same training model, I don't think even training 60 minutes, 90 minutes a day, the low intensity stuff is probably not abundant to really be maximizing the gift they're bringing to the game. And that is the point, is that we have to identify up front the profile, then we can go, okay, how's this player gonna achieve their best performance? Right, we know what Mbappe is gonna bring to the table, right? It's not necessarily gonna be the aerobic side, but those players where it is the aerobic side, the guys we do want to be able to cover 12, 13 Ks consistently, we have to feed that aerobic system. And so, you know, the minimal effective dose and these kind of things get thrown out there as being important. And I understand why, but what happens with that is we can run into a trap of just maintaining, 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 maintaining. But when do we improve? When do we build? And then we look back and go, is this player moving or not? And I think that's, that's the challenge I'd present to folk as a, as a good discussion to have within their clubs. But yeah, I'll pass on to Damien. Yeah, I, just, I wanted to just go back to where I started quite early on in, yeah. the, in, in the podcast, really, which was about um, the accelerations and decelerations. And, and, and it, a really interesting finding, which I found in my PhD quite early on, was it was an observation initially that, there seem to be more high intensity decelerations occurring in football than high intensity accelerations. And that difference was quite large. It was, I think of, out of all team sports, I looked at in that review, football was the largest difference between accelerations and decelerations. And I think, you know, in some uh, studies, more recent studies, uh, La Liga, uh, you're looking at possibly up to 80% greater frequencies of, of decelerations at the high intensity level. Now, I think that, that, that obviously brings a really important question that we, we, we've got so much consideration to improve in acceleration and top speed, but we perhaps haven't had as much understanding in the past about how players decelerate and cope with these really high intensity breaking demands, which the modern game brings to the, you know, the elite football player. And I think these demands are gonna get even higher you know, with, with what we just talked about, the game's going to get faster. We're, players are going to be performing more rapid accelerations, rapid decelerations, but particularly these high-intensity decelerations, I think, need special attention because it's a very different uh, stimulus than, than accelerations in that the force forces that we're encountering, encountering during decelerations are very different. You know, they are very much higher in magnitude um, a recent paper that I've been writing, um, we're looking at around about six times body mass for some breaking steps, whereas your acceleration, we're looking at around about two times body mass. That's, that's the peak forces that the player has to encounter repeatedly, 80 to 90 times, possibly you know, three, four, five, six steps in, in that sequence of breaking steps. Um, so that for me, you know, and we've, we've seen it in the modern game these days that defensive pressing involving rapid decelerations is the most inciting, inciting event for ACL injuries. We're looking at around about a third to two thirds in uh, football based off current studies, which have looked good studies, which have looked at systematic video evidence of ACL injuries. There seems to be a repetition there, an occurrence and a pattern that these are occurring in um, these defensive pressing high speed movements where there's a, a late distraction so the, 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 the player who's trying to close down the opponent there's a sudden change um, in the movement pattern quite late in the deceleration where the player has to adjust and that puts them in un, un, unwanted positions um, so that, that brings me on to a really important question obviously and, and as Gary has mentioned how do we move the needle you know, in terms of how do we improve the player's deceleration in addition to their acceleration qualities? Because in essence, that's going to win the games. That's, that's going to, 
that's going to be, you know, we've, we've mentioned risk reward. I think the reward for players who can accelerate and decelerate at higher intensities. And we published a recent study on this actually in an English League Two professional team uh, showed that when across the whole season, when they had greater frequencies of high intensity accelerations and decelerations, they won more matches compared to when they lost. Uh, you know, the you know the limitation of that it was only numbers. You know, we didn't get much context to that data, but it certainly highlights to me the importance of being able to perform those really high speed movements. So, how do we develop them? You know, is a really interesting question, and how do we include them within the the micro cycle leading up to matches? when we know they could have a really damaging effect, particularly the decelerations on players' performance during match day. Um, so, yeah, I'm, you know, I think if we're looking at 80, 90 decelerations, 50 accelerations per match as an example, you know, I've seen some weekly micro cycles where you're looking at possibly three times decelerations per week of that match, match day frequency. You know, so that's a hell of a lot of high intensity decelerations that the player is performing across a weekly cycle. For me, I think, you know, your small sided games, we're, see, we're seeing a lot of frequency of high intensity decelerations, but does it actually in, enhance their maximal capacity? I think it's a really important question. I think frequency and being able to tolerate those, um, but, but does it actually improve the, their ability to increase that capacity? So I think that's a really important question. And there was a study actually, it wasn't published in a brilliant uh, journal, but um, some good authors on this paper and they actually compared small-sided games uh, with, with um, during, during, a, during a cycle. They looked at uh, the, the XL, D-cell qualities, um, but they also compared that to a, a group who did small-sided games with some, as Gareth's just been mentioned, some additional eccentric overload. And uh, what was really interesting was the group who included the additional eccentric overload were the only group that had increases in maximal capacities of the, of the, of the deceleration uh, qualities. So I think that supplementary work to how we can overload these deceleration qualities to be able to drive those capacities up in players could be really important for injury prevention and also performance because we know decelerations are also critical or change of direction and you know we're looking at around about 500 to 700 change of directions per match you know so I think it really is um, you know an area which I think moving in the future can really help to enhance game and uh, reduce mitigate injuries with players as well. Yeah just to build on that that point the principal Damien talked about there of are we doing the activity to improve the capacity or are we developing the capacity in isolation? Like that principle is really key across any of these physical areas that we're talking about because there's a massive tension I see in conditioning of, is it sport specific or improving the capacity? And if we, if we move like football is a, a multifactorial complex game, but let's, step back and like I give the example of like running 400 meters right do I get better at 400 meters by just running 400 meter reps at the beginning I will because it will to a degree improve my ability to do that but very quickly I reach a ceiling very very quickly I reach a ceiling and so if I'm not also working on acceleration, if I'm not working on the maximal sprinting speed, if I'm not working on the aerobic conditioning component, over time, I don't continue to move the needle. So when we come back into the football context and say, okay, small-sided games, do they improve aerobic fitness? Well, there's some studies showing that there are improvements, but my question is, is that optimizing players' potential? That is the question for us. That is the question. And if the demands are going up in the way that we see they are, both in terms of number of games and the heights of what Jurgen Klopp's teams are doing and the high pressing and Pep Guardiola, the way that's pushing the game forward, we have to ask a better question of how alongside these specific elements, which are always going to be there and are always important, 
how are we supporting those capacities to really move that specific stuff to the next level? Because my feeling is if we're just relying on the specific stuff, we don't really have much of a bank account to draw on when it's really come, comes time to those deep competition periods with lots of games, lots of time needed to recover to actually handle that and handle that consistently and go on a run as a team when everyone else is starting to struggle because there's lots of, lots of games. And so that principle applies whether we're talking about acceleration, deceleration, or the aerobic and sprinting speed ends of things. Yeah, I think, I think it's really interesting. And in terms of, we're trying to cater for majority here, aren't we? There's always going to be cases that people bring up where they'll bring up, like we've talked about some of the players we spoke about already, the Mbappes, and then we're talking about the 1%, aren't we? Whereas we've got to try and tackle the majority and think about in, in context of who we're working with as well. Um, and I think exactly of, like ninety nine percent of your squad are not Mbappe. Right? <laughs> if only. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, no, but I think I think it's really important, isn't it? It's important for the for the listeners to consider who they're working with, how this fits into their context. But then I suppose the other thing that comes into this, which is maybe a different discussion altogether, is the culture and um, certain biases towards. Like when you were speaking, I was thinking the amount of coaches that were saying. I get we get our fitness work from the football, um, from the technical side, and it's just that mindset, isn't it? Whereas we're saying, well, yeah, that's fine, but we're talking about extras we can put in, and you've just mentioned before how it can practically work in a day or a, even a session where it doesn't even disrupt anything. Yeah, that's right, and I think there's a there's a piece for practitioners of like, what can we control? We can't necessarily control what the 60 to 90 minute session is going to be on the pitch. If we have 15 minutes in the warm up, we have some time there to get creative, right? And implement some of these micro dosing of the different stimulus and do it at a low level where it's not really interfering with anything else, right? So step one is like, are we looking for these things? And are we looking for these things year round consistently at when there's an opportunity to steer into these qualities year round so that we are building capacities all the way through. You know, I just had a call with a coach yesterday. They've got about a 10 day break now before the last seven games of the season. You know, that, that time of the season players are tired. So our discussion was around, okay, what's the, the most impactful but least fatiguing thing we can be doing. So the conversation was in this, yeah, how do we microdose these things in? We're playing lots of games. Is mass the focus? Well, maybe if we want a little bit of a boost, but how's the bank account, right, relative to where we are? Because we don't just want to be on for game one and two of that last seven. We want to be there in five, six, seven. So is there a way that we can almost have a micro periodization within that to make sure that we're, yes, hitting our stride in game one, but continuing to build through that, that last period. Yeah. And, and just on the, on the aerobic side, like we're talking about stimulus, like critical speed, we might be talking about 15 to 20 minutes of work a week and then sneaking in the low intensity stuff wherever you can. So we're not talking about huge numbers here. And to me, if we can't find 20 minutes when we're professional athletes, I think we should talk about that, yeah. you know? So like, these are things that can really be impactful and see changes very quickly in, you know, five, six weeks of doing that work that, that, will, that will set you up. Yeah. And Damien, just on some of the um, sort of numbers that you brought up before, like there's, there's the 80% difference between D cell and Axel is, I mean, that, that just blows my mind to think um, the difference. And obviously we're thinking about how the game's going to progress as well. And it's just crazy to, to think about that, to get my little mind around that in terms of practically um, how we, how that informs practice going forward, like whether it is in gym work or, or however we're preparing players, what's the sort of approach that you've got in mind that, or maybe some of the differences that we'll, we'll have to cater for us going forward. I think, first of all, with, with them numbers, Ben, obviously, I think with football, what was, there, is, there is 
limitations with the methods as well, which which have got those numbers as well. So obviously with decelerations, um, we know we can achieve max higher maximal values than what we can with accelerations. So there's more scope. You know, as Gareth's been saying, the bank the bank accounts are a bit bit bigger for for deceleration than what it is for acceleration. So we can we can go over that threshold easier than what we can with accelerations. The other thing to note um, as well is that football probably is a lot of rolling starts, you know, where it, even though players might be accelerating maximally, it's not counting as a, as a high intensity because they're already at a moving speed. And I think that's one of the big reasons why we see them big, di the, the differences um, with, with the axles and D cells using current methods and, and current um, approaches to quantify in-game accelerations and decelerations. And I think there's a lot of work needed in that area to advance practice. Um, going back to how I see this developing, um, obviously being, being mindful of the stimulus that players are getting, and as, as we've been talking about, the need to ensure players are prepared to be able to tolerate a high frequency of decelerations. And, you know, that's a very different type of muscular action than what we see with accelerations, which is more concentrically dominated, whereas the decelerations are much more reliant on the eccentric muscle action and the ability to attenuate forces. So I think it's we're seeing more and more technologies now, and I think this is where we haven't in the past, the difficulty in being able to develop eccentric strength Whereas now we've got much more practical means to be able to improve a player's eccentric strength alongside the field-based type approaches. Um, so I think that's where we're going to see, hopefully, more use of technology like flywheels to be able to develop those eccentric strength capabilities, but also on-field work that we can use to overload deceleration um, actions. Um, with, with a more coordinated, uh, specific action as well. So for example, that might be similar to like we've seen with acceleration work, uh, resisted accelerations. We may start to see more developments in assisted deceleration work where we can start to really think about different, um, different approaches and different ways to target different uh, assisted um, decelerations. You know, one of the examples that I've recently done a bit of work with is the 1080 sprint, for example, which is heavily used for profiling sprint acceleration and getting real neat profiles on individual acceleration and velocity and where they're deficient. Well, we can now start to look at that for an athlete's deceleration using the same technologies to be able to identify, right, where may this athlete be deficient in their deceleration capabilities? So we can specifically target those qualities of that athlete to ensure that they're able to decelerate and, and meet those demands of what I've just been talking about. Um, so I mean, I think, if, yeah. you, uh, if, if, if you break down that deceleration piece a bit, are there any specific muscle areas that people should be focused on that maybe have a stronger relationship with deceleration capability than versus others? Like if Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a really good question. And I think, you know, we know, you know, acceleration hamstrings is taught a lot about. It basically, it's the opposite for deceleration. So we're looking at really, really the quadriceps as being critical um, and the ankles as well being critical. Uh, the ankle and knee, I think we're looking around about 70% of the impact is attenuated at the ankle and the knee during decelerations. So eccentric strength for the quadriceps is absolutely paramount. Um, but then, you know, we're looking at the ankle extensor muscle groups as well, which, you know, like the soleus and the quadriceps, but also the tibialis anterior, all those muscles that surround the ankle, um, are really critical. So how we can develop the strength in those to be able to, to generate that extensor moment. Um, do you have any go-to exercises for those? It's really, it's really, really, really key. Um, for me, you know, I, again, it, like Ben said, it depends on the context. It depends on the population that you're working with and what you've got available. I'm 
a, a real fan of the on-field um, assisted deceleration type work. Um, that's more coordinated. And as Gareth been mentioning before, it may not isolate the quadriceps sufficiently to be able to get that, that strength in the, the quadriceps. Um, and this is where, you know, in the literature at the minute, just isolated knee extension, eccentric strength has been shown to be a, you know, a, an associate of deceleration performance. You know, so I'm, I'm being a real reductionist there, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Some of the people have tried to steer all their practice away from for many years, isn't it? Away. <laughs> but no, um, that, that's really interesting. The, the, the other thing um, that I was going to say on that, um, Damien, was in terms of where that work fits throughout a season. Because I've had this chat with a few people before in terms of we have certain parts of a season that are obvious, like, like a pre-season and off-season, that there are times, obviously, we can get more work into players. But then throughout the season as well, we spoke before, Gareth talked about um, the aerobic work and having periods, like you've just mentioned, the conversation you've had recently of a, of a time where players are, are off for whatever reason or no gains for, for a period. So... There, there has to be a real element of like flexibility and being able to adapt to those times when they come, don't they, throughout a season and, and how the programme can be sort of adapted at those times, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's certainly, you know, it's the art of trying to mix method training approach, you know, and I think it, as we've been trying to allude to, you know, the specific conditioning the stuff which I call like the breaking performance type exercise is absolutely critical, you know, in terms of being able to uh, break under, you know, in high pressure situations when there's chaos, absolutely essential that we can, we can build those small sided games work or the specific, you know, uh, unanticipated, decelerations into our training so that they get the perceptual cognitive elements but alongside that we have to consider the more um you know like what i would refer to as the breaking elementary and the breaking development type exercises which target the specific underpinning qualities that are going to give you that ability to then transfer that onto the field of play mm. and and i think that's where for me, I've, I've, I've been on both sides of the equation, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, I, I started highly specific. You need to be highly specific and all this isolated training is rubbish. And then I went more, you know, you need to target the specific qualities, but I think it's, it's a bit of both. You've got to get a bit of both because the perception action for me is limited by the player's action capabilities. So your perceptual capabilities will be, dampened or will be reduced if you haven't got the ability to act and you know your body's um perceptual you know movement capabilities is really for me run by damage reduction you know it's, it's trying to reduce the potential damage to the organism so i think um that's always in the back you know that subconscious control of movement particularly with deceleration and I think that's where we need to develop those qualities, those underpinning qualities. It's really important. And, you know, somebody who hasn't got them qualities, I would say, you know, you can do as much acceleration and speed work, but when that, that could potentially be, be harmful because you're increasing that player's momentum without them having the ability to then be able to reduce that momentum. And, um, yeah, that, that's some of which I think the profiling should be able to advance us in profiling. We should be able to see where the player's acceleration is compared to their deceleration. Um, I think as well to build build on that, a good principle is like weekly, are we really clear on which of these qualities we're building and which we're maintaining? And if we're not doing one of those, then we're probably detraining it. You know, and so like it sounds very silly and simple, but hey, when you let that stuff go and then reintroduce it, that's when you start reintroducing DOMS. That's when you start reintroducing spikes in load and we know what that does to injury risk. So I think that's a key kind of heuristic that coaches can use on a weekly basis is like, here's my checklist of the, the six qualities. So just to reel them off, 
you know, maximal sprinting speed, maximal aerobic speed, critical speed, acceleration, deceleration. Uh, what have I missed? Anything? Nope. So nope. Okay, top, top, top speed. Top, yeah. top speed, yeah. So, you know, if you have those and you're looking every week, okay, which of these are we building and are we maintaining? And as Damien alluded to, when you're in the kind of rudimentary underpinning phase, these might mean not actually doing the movement, right, on the pitch. This might mean not actually doing the movement in the gym. It might be physio related, right? There might be some real low hanging fruit. And I find this a lot with max velocity. There might be some real low hanging fruit that just needs someone to improve, let's say their range of motion, right? Or their stability in certain positions. And so some of these things, when you first say it can sound crazy, but when you dip into how many of these underpinning elements are we actually training or have we trained or have we moved the needle on with all the athletes, there's actually a lot of room to grow. And, you know, you're not going to get there overnight because of the, the game demands, but you do want to be chipping it away at these over time because that's when you're going to build those capacities over time. Because if we're not, if the demands are shooting up and our preparation isn't matching that, then you're just going to get a greater disconnect between what's required and where and how well we can handle it. So it comes back to catering for individuals within the team environment again, doesn't it? And um, everything we've spoke about has, has um, referred back to that, I suppose, hasn't it? And and that refers to individuals within a team, but then it also refers to team to team as well, doesn't it? Because we're going to have different environments, team to team, game models and cultures and all the rest yeah. of it. Um, there's a lot of factors involved in that, isn't there? Yeah, it, that there are, but hopefully what this framework kind of does is almost like streamline the big rocks for people in terms of focus. So like step one, as you said, then like across squads, the coaches, what the coaches model is giving you is going to be different from a physical prep standpoint. So let's understand that. And then let's be really clear where we're at across those six qualities we just alluded to. And from there, you've got a great basis to then move from, right? Sure, there are going to be individuals who have requirements that are not in that list, but that's maybe 5%, five, 10% of the needle as opposed to like probably 90% of the qualities that are going to get you a lot of the way there. Um, yeah. Incredible. Lads, an hour, we're just short of an hour. That has absolutely flown by. Um, I feel like we've covered... A fair amount there in in an hour, and I really appreciate you coming on and doing it. But I'll just say, just finally, have you got any sort of final thoughts to wrap things up? Anything to sort of summarise what we spoke about? Um, Gareth, do you, have you got anything? Um, I think uh, a phrase I would use is like, have firm opinions loosely held on this stuff. Um, meaning, I'm generally there talking about training and training models because with like survivorship bias we tend to see like a successful model and then everyone wants to do what the germans were doing right after the them winning the world cup and then all oh, what are the spanish doing right and then we all want to do that and so i think you know we want to learn from those things we want to understand them but when we get drawn too far towards those we're kind of getting blown in the wind and that can distract us sometimes from the things that are going to move the needle for us over time. And equally, our coach right now might not be using that model. Mm. And so we can really anchor our practice and the development of our athletes by having these kind of grounded principles. And yeah, we want to learn and we want to take the best from those other things. But one of those models is not going to work for all of the athletes in your squad hundred percent because the variation in their their physiology is, is so different so these things really enable us to yes work with the training model we had and then build the individuals for what they need alongside that and that gives us the greatest chance of getting more hits with more players over the time real damien anything from you I think I'd just conclude with a quote that we included in the letter in response to George Nassis, which was from Tom Riley. And Tom Riley, for people who don't know Tom, he was the founder of uh, 
sports science degrees in the UK back in 1975. And he was the probably the person who um, kind of like give rise to applied research in, in soccer. Um, and, and his quote, which has stuck with me throughout all my education, is we need to have an intimate understanding of the demands of competition, the adaptive response, and the assessment process to be able to advance our understanding of, of support. Um, so I think that, for me, um, is a nice finish, really. Yeah. Brilliant. And everyone will be trying to follow the, the English way once we win the World Cup this year anyway, so... Um, that, that's going to be the next trend. We can only hope, Ben. We can only hope. <laughs> Lads, this has been brilliant. I've really enjoyed it. I could have probably done this all day, so I really appreciate you giving up the time and coming on. Um, just finally, for, to keep it up to date with what you guys have got going on, um, some incredible stuff that you've, you've been releasing recently. Just, do you want to just give any sort of handles where you want to direct people? Gareth, do you want to go first? Yeah, people can find me on Twitter at Gareth underscore Sanford. DMs are open, so feel free to reach out. And you, Damien? Yeah, um, so you can contact me at, on Twitter. I'm only only on Twitter at the minute, unfortunately. So it's dhmov um, on Twitter. Um, and also, hopefully, shortly, um, a website which will be devoted to, to human breaking performance as well. Brilliant. Uh, but that's, that's yet to be released. We'll keep an eye out for that. I'm sure that will go out on the socials once it's once it's live, won't it? It will, yes, definitely. Perfect. Lads, thank you very much. I really, really appreciate you giving up your time and doing that. That was absolutely quality and uh, stay in touch. Yeah, yes. thanks, Ben. Thank you, Ben.